and welcome to this webinar entitled Gender Parity in Your Organization's What Measures Translate into Meaningful Results. My name is Caroline Kotze and I'm the President and Founder of Women in Governance. It is my pleasure to be here today so that we can talk about parity certification that was launched in 2017. I have had a very extensive career in the corporate world for the past 25 years and decided to dedicate myself to all questions around gender equality and the advancement of women. I have been fortunate to receive several awards uh, over the past decade for my work around that topic and will be uh, sharing more information about what the reasons are for my passion for this subject. So Women in Government, in Governance is a non-for-profit organization that was founded in 2010. We have been organizing some major events with both local, national, and international speakers. And we created, uh, three years ago, an executive mentorship program. Our goal is to support women who are at the VP level of major organizations to go through the glass ceiling and get a seat at the board table or be um, nominated in roles uh, uh, such as CEO or, or chairs of boards. Uh, we also offer governance training. We want to equip women uh, as best as we can so that they are ready for the boardroom table. We know that they are experienced, we know that they are skilled and they're educated. Sometimes they just need that little extra support to be able to um, showcase their, um, their skills and get a um, a major uh, board, uh, board seat. Um, the parity certification is what we will be talking mostly about during this webinar. Uh, we'll get into that uh, a little bit later on. And obviously social media, uh, we'd like to invite you to follow us on uh, all those uh, logos that you see right here. We have a pretty impressive presence, uh, close to 50,000 followers on all these different uh, uh, social media. And there are a lot of interesting discussions that take place on a daily basis where women and men exchange on different topics, share articles, share events, uh, and discuss their, their, their points of views and, and what can be done to, um, to have a, a better situation here in Canada uh, for women. These are some of the events that we have hosted over the past year. Uh, as you can see, we have people who are from the corporate world, political, former political leaders as well. Uh, our goal is to inspire men and women. Our goal is also to get people to network. Our galas are very well attended. We usually have uh, about 800 people uh, and a long waiting list. So uh, if you're ever interested in joining us for an event, register early. So what is the situation today in terms of parity here in Quebec, in Canada, we'll talk about the US briefly, and the rest of the world as well. Well, in Canada, although we have uh, women represented uh, at 28% uh, uh, of uh, the National Assembly, um, almost 40% are ministers, but only 17.3% are mayors. We finally had our first, very first woman mayor here in Montreal. Um, but the situation when it comes to boards is still quite alarming. The large boards of directors, when we're looking at the TSX 60, uh, are close to 20%, but on average, we're talking about 14% of women on corporate boards. In 2018, those numbers are alarming. Also, the, um, there's a very high percentage of women in roles that are uh, traditionally attributed to them, such as care, office work, sales, uh, and these haven't changed much over the past 30 years. Uh, in Quebec, under the Charest government, there's a law, uh, the Governance Act, uh, that uh, required that crown corporations have parity. So these 22 uh, crown corporations have moved from 27.5% to 52.4%, in only five years, so that just demonstrates that when you legislate, you find the women, and when you don't legislate, you find excuses. This is also what we've seen in other countries, when we think of Nordic countries, when we think of France, for instance. France has moved from 12% to 40% in just a few years. In the meantime, Canada moved from 12 to 14%. So legislation in France has 
had a deep impact and a very um, quick uh, change has been seen as well. Canada is of course seen on the global uh, scale as being a top leader for many um, topics, including uh, gender equality. Unfortunately, we have lost a bit of momentum. Uh, in uh, 2016, uh, the uh, Global Gender Report uh, that was published by the World Economic Forum uh, showed Canada at the 36th rank in terms of women's participation in the economy and their economic opportunities. This is a big drop from numbers that were 10 years earlier in 2006 when we had earned the 10th position. So it doesn't mean that Canada has regressed, but it means that the rest of the world has progressed at, much, at a much faster pace. Women, as I mentioned earlier, only occupy 14% of board seats. This number is alarmingly low, and very few, almost none of the European countries have such uh, poor numbers. Um, if we look at the TSX 60, which is the 60 largest publicly traded companies in Canada, only one of them actually has a woman CEO. There's only 5% of women CEO in Canada. Well, in the United States, uh, if we look at uh, the Global Gender Report of 2016, once again, um, the US actually scored worse than Canada, overall ranking 45th. Um, so I guess that kind of could make us feel a little bit better. However, uh, the U.S. did get a better score in terms of women's participation in the economy and their economic opportunities. Uh, and for that um, metric, they found themselves at the 26th position versus Canada at the 36th. One of the reasons why uh, the Americans score higher uh, is for, because of certain subcategories, like, for instance, legislators, senior officials that have done um, that have had better um, progression than we have here in Canada. At the global level, uh, while the situation is not great, uh, we've seen increases of only 3% in five years of women in decision-making bodies. Uh, there are different um, numbers that we see, uh, whether through uh, different reports or through the uh, a World Economic Forum that say that it'll take us more than 100 years at this pace to catch up. A third of companies worldwide still don't have a single woman in senior management positions. I think it's also important to outline that in Canada, 45% of publicly traded companies don't even have one woman on their board. So we're not even thinking of how far are we of gender equality on these boards. We're thinking of adding the very first woman ever at the board of these 45% of organizations. In the UK, David Cameron had written to each chairman of a board that had zero women. And that had a very deep impact because it was the tone at the top. David Cameron was demonstrating his interest towards gender equality and sending the message that these companies were being watched. We at Women in Governance have actually also asked the same from Justin Trudeau. Uh, we're hopeful that he will um, also uh, do something similar. Uh, we're still uh, waiting. Uh, Eastern Europe is actually not doing so bad. And it's interesting to see that in Russia, for instance, there are 45% of women in senior management positions. So this is a legacy from their co communist years uh, where equality was uh, at the forefront. Um, Iceland, uh, as uh, many of us know, is the very first country in the Global Gender Report of 2016 with an overall gender gap index of 0 0.874. If we compare to Canada, we are, as a reminder, at the 35th rank. So Iceland is a great example for us to follow. So why is this something that we still need to worry about today? Uh, the main reasons uh, that we will look at are economic and social. So to begin with the economic reason, first of all, when I have discussions with either CEOs or chairs of boards, I always tell them, if you're not doing this for the ethical reason, because today women 
are entitled to having the same, playing the same role as a man. Do it for your company's financial performance. There have been so many research, so many studies that demonstrate the positive impact on the financial performance of organizations when there are more women and more diversity as a whole because we can also talk about people who are immigrants, uh, LGBTQ, um, all sorts of minorities uh, that, that will contribute to the conversation. When we have around a boardroom table um, people who all look alike, people who dress alike, people who think alike, we tend to get to what is called groupthink, meaning that yes, we will get, we will reach a decision faster, we will all agree, but is that the most robust decision-making process? No, it's not. If we want innovation, if we want to be competitive, if we want to come up with great new ideas, if we want to be strong um, in terms of, uh, of our uh, leadership uh, for, uh, for equality and we want that to resonate with our employees and increase their engagement, uh, increase our, our visibility and our branding as well, we really need to invite women at the table. Canada, and there, there's, there, there was this McKinsey Global Institute report that, that, that found that Canada could add $150 billion in additional GDP uh, by 2026. That's a 0.6% increase in annual GDP growth. Uh, Globally, we're talking $28 trillion that could be added um, by 2025 to the global annual GDP. So this impact is roughly equivalent to the combined size of today's Chinese and American economies. So there really should be continued focus on this because we all want growth. We all want to be in more prosperous economies, more prosperous societies, and there's a very easy way to achieve that invite women at the table. Social reasons, well, of course, we talked about uh, ethics earlier. Uh, half of the human race is female. Actually, I think we've, we're up to 52% at this point. Uh, women are citizens that need to be part of all decisions, whether at the political uh, level, at the economical, administrative bodies need to be uh, also um, a space where women can be integrated. They contribute with their knowledge, their work, obviously their taxes are benefiting our, our society. And we need, in this day and age of shortage of talent, we need all the skill sets that we can use. So counting on only half the population is a big mistake. Parity will enrich, as I mentioned earlier, all the decision making by allowing women's points of view to the table. They can contribute by their own experiences and there are examples that are even more striking than everything else that we've been talking about, and that are these organizations that are um, dedicated to serving women, for instance, clothing companies that only sell clothing to women, that have majority of women employees, yet don't even have one woman on their board, as if a woman's opinion in terms of the company strategy doesn't matter. So what has been done so far, I have spoken earlier about the Governance Act for Crown Corporations here in Quebec. Ontario, Kathleen Wynne has announced that they are also going to do the same because it actually works, uh, because Quebec is doing phenomenally well with parity in all uh, uh, Crown Corporations, such as our, our Hydro-Quebec, our Liquor Board, etc. There's also the Complier Explain that was introduced about three years ago uh, by the Securities Commissions across the country. The Ontario Securities Commissions was the very first to adopt it. It was inspired by the UK. Uh, now, we also have this at the Autorité des Marchés Financiers here in Quebec, and the report that came out two years after it was implemented uh, demonstrated that there was little, very little impact. Uh, so companies are asked to divulge what they do in terms of feminine representation in leadership roles and on the board, or explain why they have not been successful. So this is actually turning into an explain or explain more than anything else. Uh, there is a federal bill, Bill C-25, um, that was voted not long ago, uh, 
that essentially took the same concept as the comply or explain, but turned it into a federal law, hoping that it might have a bigger impact. There are six senators, four men and two women, who um, asked for amendments to that law, uh, suggesting that we could go a step further and actually ask of these organizations to not only divulge Comply or explain, divulge what they do in terms of feminine representation, but actually set objectives, set targets, and try to comply to them. So they, these are targets that they are choosing on their own, based on their uh, own industry, based on what they think that they can uh, achieve, and then just uh, share their results and move towards that, uh, that objective. Unfortunately, the bill was the, the amendments were rejected. It was pretty close. It was uh, something like 34 and 39 against, and there were uh, about nine abstentions. So we could have we could have had uh, a, something that had that would have had a big impact, uh, I believe, here in Canada. Because when we look at companies that actually do set objectives, there's only 11 percent in Canada that do set objectives. But those that do have an average 26% of women on boards, whereas those that don't have an average 13% of women on boards. So it is not that much to ask to, that companies put that as part of their strategy and decide uh, whatever it is up to them. You know, in, by 2020, we'd like to have 20% of women on boards. By 2025, we'd like to have 25%. I'm making numbers up, but each company should make that a priority. And the sad part of the story is that this amendment was rejected only a couple of days before International Women's Day. So we need to stop just talking and smoking mirrors and start acting. And things like this would be a good proof of really believing in the positive impact of, uh, of parity. The quote is in Europe, uh, perceptions and realities. Well, some perceptions are that women are nominated on a board simply because they are a woman. The truth of the matter is no woman will be nominated on a board if she doesn't have the skill set, the experience, the education that are required to hold that seat. So if we need an additional incentive to actually open the door for women, push women in, and then it will become a habit, it will become something normal, then we need to do that. Parity certification is what we were able to come up with here in Quebec and now across Canada at Women in Governance. We decided to take matters into our own hands and come up with a questionnaire on about 75 points that my colleague Nicole Piggott will talk to you more in details uh, about in, in just a few uh, seconds. We are the first ones in Canada to launch this. It's the only parity certification that is offered, and it is now offered nationwide. This is a wonderful way for each company that is serious about their dedication towards the cause to be measured against, uh, against some uh, very uh, concrete data, uh, to be benchmarked, and to get their results. Um, but I will not uh, divulge any more information. I will let my colleague uh, do that in just a second. And so I will turn it over to my colleague, Nicole Piggott, who co-chairs the Committee of the Parity Certification. Thanks. Caroline? So my name is Nicole Piggott. My name is Nicole Piggott. And um, I have the, uh, the privilege of being the co-chair of the Parity Certification Committee at Women in Governance. Um, and so let me talk to you a little bit about um, what prompted me and compelled me to, be, um, to take this, uh, this mantle on. In my 25-year career in HR in major Canadian organizations, um, I have seen the tremendous value that um, organizations gain from gender uh, representation in, in senior leadership positions. Um, the diversity of thought, the diversity of, uh, of 
problem solving, the creative innovation that occurs, um, and the representation of the markets that we serve in um, in the Canadian uh, in the Canadian marketplace. So it's my opinion that it's not a nice to have; it's absolutely a business imperative. And so, and it's not a personal opinion that has that has been gleaned through 25 years of experience. Um, all of the studies indicate that culturally diverse companies and uh, gender diverse uh, companies outperform um, non-diverse companies by a substantial amount. And it was never more vivid than um, following the downturn in the economy in 2008 where we saw that companies that were diverse, both from a gender perspective and a cultural perspective, rebounded much faster from the downturn than those companies that had not um, um, embraced uh, the flexibility of thought and the agility that is acquired through gender and cultural diversity. So what did we do at Women in Governance? We got together, we got a number of experts together, including some of the major uh, consultancy firms in, um, in Canada, and we collaborated to put together a robust certification that enables organizations to do an audit of their practices, their thinking, their vision, and their um, results as it pertains to uh, gender diversity, gender parity and to assess those results as compared to their, the rest of the companies in, uh, that are participating in the certification. So it really is a landmark um, initiative. So let's talk about what are the key elements to success in, um, in evaluating gender parity. The research that we have done uh, shows that there are three key elements of success. The first is ensuring that a company has invested the uh, effort in developing a strategy around uh, gender diversity. A, a company really needs to be able to embed both in their communications, in their, their priorities and values, their mission and vision statements, that they are committed to achieving, not only achieving gender diversity, and gender parity, but sustaining it over time through a robust pipeline. The second element that is uh, critical is taking that strategy that a company has developed and putting in place the programs and the practices that will enable that strategy to be brought to light and, and deliver results. And so we assess in, in our certification process the various programs, and the practices that the company has put in place in order to achieve gender parity. And the final thing is you can't have a strategy in actions and not assess what those strategies and actions are yielding. And so we look at the results that the, um, the company or the organization has achieved and we look at it quite thoroughly. Um, really, we look at every aspect that could influence both the business outcome but the representation of women in key, in key areas uh, throughout the organization. So it's our belief that these three critical areas are a way for a company to not only achieve gender parity, but to sustain it over time. Now, um, one of the things that I feel compelled to mention at this point is the research that we have done has, has demonstrated that not all policies, programs, or practices are created equal. So while uh, an organization may invest in um, any specific program, the degree to which they have um, holistically embedded that commitment to that program is really the differentiator between companies that have been successful in achieving results and companies that are lagging. So let's look a little more in depth at these three areas. The first area that we just talked about was strategy, which is really what we call governance and vision. We look at a number of specific uh, features in that area to help us to ascertain whether a company is, has the right elements in place strategically 
to be able to achieve gender parity. The first thing is ensuring that they have thoroughly integrated parity in their company values and the priorities of the company. The second is looking at that, that they have explicit communications of that commitment throughout the organization, but there's no confusion and there's no um, question on the part of employees, uh, stakeholders who engage with that organization, and the executive of that organization that the organization is committed to gender parity. The next is um, something that Caroline spoke of that she was able to demonstrate through the data uh, yields results, and that is setting targets. Companies need to set an objective. Now, we're not asking companies to uh, set unrealistic objectives, but progress need, will only be made if a commitment is set at the more senior levels of the organization for the company to achieve targets, um, targets um, progressively to gender parity and a date at which they want to achieve that target at the board of director level, at the executive committee level, and at all levels throughout the organization. The other thing is looking that there's concrete measures taken and mechanisms put in place to achieve gender parity. Not simply that you're going to say, it's a nice thing, we really want it in our company, but that you're just hoping that through osmosis it will just happen to occur. You actually have to put the effort in in order to achieve the result, put the infrastructure in place that helps to bring gender parity, uh, make it a reality. And then, you know, in this age of the Me Too movement, uh, one of my biggest concerns about the Me Too movement is I don't want it to become an event. Um, I want it to become something that's inculcated in the DNA of organizations and the DNA of the way society operates, such that harassment and discrimination is a thing of the past. And so organizations that embrace gender parity create um, uh, welcoming and integrated, uh, inclusive environments for uh, gender parity. And so there is no, there's a robust education and prevention program in place against discrimination and harassment. And that companies also need to demonstrate externally that they support gender parity by investing in organizations that support women in their sector or their industry and the advancement of women professionally. So it's not just internally that they're demonstrating that, but externally they're investing in organizations uh, that support the advancement of women. And we've seen that at Women in Governance, where a number of um, top-tier companies have openly supported the efforts uh, that we have, uh, we have undertaken. And the elimination, the, the lastly in governance, what we look for is the elimination of unconscious bias from the recruitment process. Um, studies have shown that despite the best of intentions, um, un uh, the biases that we all have as we evolve and as we develop in, our, in the societies in which we operate, um, cloud and influence our decisions. And we just become better uh, at, at, at developing really creative excuses as to why um, the woman wasn't the right candidate for the job and the man was the better candidate for the job. And so organizations that have recognized that these biases influence our decisions um, have invested in education of their employees and, and have put in place, in fact, systems that help to mitigate the biases that we all hold so that they don't influence the recruitment process negatively. The next area is looking at actions, the collect, what we call the collective enablers. And that's one of the areas that we look at is ensuring that the company, at the top levels of the company, designates um, a team that is sponsored by an executive um, that is solely responsible for, um, for bringing about an inclusive and diverse uh, work environment, specifically in our case, ensuring that gender parity is a goal and that the actions are monitored and followed. And our experience is that when there's a dedicated team or a dedicated person, it's the best way to bring that, that, that about. Programs to develop leadership competencies are critical, and it's also important to look at those programs to ensure that those programs um, embrace those qualities and competencies that are uniquely or predominantly female, um, which in the past may not have been um, as valued and, in fact, are critical to success.
in a global economy. The next thing, and I already talked about executive sponsorship, the, the, the fourth thing that we look at is ensuring that you've implemented sponsorship and mentoring programs within the organization. Our experience is that sponsorship is the key. Uh, when an executive makes it their mandate to help a, a or a number of women move through the pipeline in the organization, the hierarchy in the organization, they make it their mission to do that. Um, that's where you see results. Um, we also think that um, financial support of employees who participate in programs and associations that promote women, male and female employees, we find that that's an, another great way to help to create an environment that fosters the advancement of women. Another area that has been a deterrent or uh, um, has been difficult for women to overcome has been in the performance evaluation where um, elements that are um, features of the female, female persona are less valued. So the elimination of unconscious bias in the performance evaluation process is another area that we've seen that companies have made a commitment to gender parity in the workplace. Programs that retain high-performing women and strong, high-potential women are also features that we look for, as well as the sensitization and uh, demonstrated commitment of leaders of the value of gender parity, so that the leadership throughout the organization recognizes that gender parity is, is critical. And then the last area that we look at is results. So all of the things that we talked about all the strategies that you put in place, all the programs that you put in place, all the financial commitments that you make towards advancing women, we look to see that, that uh, the, the distribution of women and the approach to um, uh, managing the organization is equitable. And the areas that we look at is, are the ratios of women to men throughout the organization at all levels of the organization. We look at to, and we look at all levels of the organization because it's important that in order to sustain gender parity at the top, that there is a continuous pipeline of women throughout the organization. Um, we're also looking to make sure that women are well represented in historically underrepresented positions in um, in the organization, which may be junior to senior leadership. For example, I had a, a career in the mining industry. And it's unusual to see a high proportion of women in, in the mine. And um, we're looking to see strategies being put in place in these companies to attract women um, to these non-traditional roles for women. We look at turnover rates of men versus women. We look at hiring rates of men versus women. Are we hiring more men than women? Why are you surprised that you don't have gender parity when you're not hiring uh, women at the same rate that you're hiring men. And in some cases, we need to make, make up um, uh, a deficit by hiring more women than men. Um, promotion rates of women versus men. Are you promoting women at an equivalent rate to the promotion of men? Uh, another area that we look at that's really interesting is the engagement scores that com when companies conduct engagement surveys, looking to see whether the scores for men are the same as the scores for women. When there's disparity there, it suggests that something in the culture of the organization um, has created some sort of uh, disparity in the treatment of men and women. And then we look at targets set in the proportion of women in leadership positions, as well as salary equity, ensuring that for all things being equal, that women are being treated from a salary and remuneration perspective the same as men are. So, where are we going from here? One of the things that we're looking at, our current certification applies to organization, large organizations in Canada. And as Caroline shared with you earlier, um, our certification is now at the national level. So Canada, Canadian organizations um, anywhere in Canada can participate in the certification process. Um, one of the things that we recognize is that in Canada, the largest cohort um, in the business population is our small to medium companies. And so for us, we thought it would be important to uh, launch a certification in 2019 that, um, that is adapted to the 
realities of small to medium companies. But that will only be something that we'll be able to adopt if we get uh, support from um, our government um, uh, sponsors. So why should you certify? Why should you consider um, uh, achieving a certification? Well, to evaluate the level of commitment of your company towards parity. It's a great audit of all of your systems to, to assess whether you are on track to your own goals towards achieving gender parity. It allows you to analyze your practices and your results at all levels of your organization. It allows you to create an awareness of the elements that need work in order to improve and to progress towards gender parity, and to openly disclose to your employees your commitment to that by uh, demonstrating that you are seeking um, this, this certification, and to compare against the best practices in your sector and other sectors. What is the certification process? Um, the launch was March 8th, International Women's Day, um, and we have extended um, our um, the deadline to Submit, quest, uh, uh, submit your application to June 30th, 2018. Um, the process is the company would uh, go to the Women in Government uh, certification page and there is a pre-qualification questionnaire that needs to be completed. And the purpose of that is not to exclude companies from participating in the certification, but it's really a way for us to assess uh, upfront whether a company has the minimum specifications to be able to qualify for the minimum level of certification, which is bronze. And if they are not, they can still continue with the certification for the purposes of auditing their activities so that they can then put in place those mitigations such that next year or in future years, they will be able to apply for a certification and achieve um, a certification uh, level. After validation, um, access to the online questionnaire is provided to the company um, following payment for the uh, access to the questionnaire. And the questionnaire is then um, involves a myriad of questions which, which cover the subjects that we just went over in the, in the three areas that we evaluate. And then the final evaluation and the certification outcome is disclosed to companies in August of this year. And we will be celebrating all of the companies, um, not, not necessarily disclose, we don't disclose their certification level, but we do celebrate the value of gender parity and those companies that are at the platinum level at the gala uh, that we will be having in Montreal in September 2018. And we intend to have a gala in Toronto later this year following our gala in Montreal. So we will um, look out for that. Um, announcement in the coming uh, weeks. And a detailed report is delivered to each of the participant companies that gives them detailed information on how they their results uh, netted out and how they compare to their sector and to um, uh, the other uh, the other companies that participated. The certification um, questionnaire, um, sets thresholds for each evaluated category. So we have bronze, silver, gold, and platinum um, uh, thresholds for each uh, category. And the sum of those categories results in the ultimate certification level for, for, the, for the participant organizations. Um, certain elements, as I spoke of earlier, such as a parity policy or the absence of an, a harassment uh, policy um, would be disqualifiers for qualifying for certification, but does not exclude companies from being able to audit their practices. So, in conclusion, we encourage you to visit the, the uh, Women in Governance uh, certification tab on our on our website, where you will find more information about what we um, what we offer in um, in this area. We encourage you to complete the pre-qualification questionnaire and follow the instructions that appear. And do not hesitate to contact us at any time at certification at womenandgovernance.org, where we will be happy to answer your questions. We usually get back to you within 24 hours um, and sometimes minutes um, of you sending your question through to us. 
we really uh, committed to um, progressing women to leadership roles in corporations in, in Canada, not as a nice to have, but as, as I said before, a business imperative. Um, our colleagues are waiting for you, so please, please consider it. So we thank you for your commitment to gender parity. We know that you, like us, realize that this is the path to success into the future. Embracing inclusion and diversity is the only way that we're going to be able to navigate a global economy. Um, and that has been demonstrated uh, through the data. This is not something that uh, women have, uh, have, have um, put forth um, as a self-serving um, initiative. And I will remind you that the deadline has been extended to the end of June. So we encourage you to uh, put forth your pre-qualification questionnaire as soon as possible so that we can give you access to the questionnaire. Thanks very much.